Hey everyone, I'm starting the recording a little early before class. I'm not going to start talking about uh, our stuff for today for another couple minutes, but um, someone was asking in the chat here about uh, just confirming again what's going on with the response paper, so I thought it'd be uh, good if you wanted to hear about this. Um, so yeah, the response papers, I used a metaphor of a movie review for this, in that what your job is, is to do a critical evaluation. And critical doesn't always mean negative. It can mean positive things too, like what you think works versus what didn't work, just like a, a movie reviewer would. They, their job is to identify to the best of their ability, and to maybe argue for it, what works and what doesn't work in a film. What makes it valuable, you know, what makes it not valuable. The criteria for you know, like an aesthetic evaluation, like for a movie, though, is very different than what we're doing for uh, this response paper for a philosophy paper. But that same kind of like uh, critical mindset or an evaluative mindset is, is, I think, the right way to go with this. Um, your job is to evaluate the merits of the arguments that are offered. So, what arguments do you think they're making good points? You know, this is a this is a significant. Um, a bit of reasoning to have on the radar. Um, what arguments do you think are open to objections? You can play devil's advocate for things. Um, you could make suggestions for other um, relevant concerns that are a part of the debate that the student is engaged with. Um, maybe you think they've got some blind spots in their analysis that they should be incorporating. Uh, you can make those kinds of recommendations too. The big thing that I'm trying to emphasize is that this isn't like a response paper or a peer review of an English paper assignment. So you might have had to do assignments like this for an English class and it's not so much about the paper craft as much as the reasoning. Um, I'm not grading you based on grammar and spelling and sentence structure and stuff like that. I'm grading you based on your intellectual work and that's what I want you doing uh, when you're evaluating stuff for the response paper too. Is that is that helping Bernadette? Yeah, okay, cool. And anything else um, people are wondering about, maybe with the response paper, it's not a bad thing to talk about. We still got a couple more minutes before 12.30. Yeah, 800 words is not that much. That, And again, that's just like an absolute minimum. Just like the 1,500 words is the absolute minimum for the paper, you can do a lot more. Um, there's no upper limit um, for any of these writing assignments. Like just for the journals, a 500 word minimum. I'm not, uh, but you could do a, something much more ambitious if you wanted to. Um, if you've got more things that you'd want to say or that you think might be helpful to your author, then by all means put it in there. That's totally cool. Mm hmm. I remember when I was younger, writing writing to a certain word count was like an intimidating thing to do. You know, writing papers, finding out enough to say. Um, and then when I started writing philosophy papers, the scope of that or the scale of the calibration on that really changes. Um, because when you're actually trying to get something accomplished argumentatively, uh, that takes a lot more space to do it um, and to address all the things that are worthy of being addressed, that are relevant, to be sensitive to. There's there's a lot going on there. That's why I've said before um, for your papers, like if you've got a really good rational controversy framed, then uh, in some ways the paper writes itself. You're not going to run out of stuff because um, <clears throat> there's plenty to be considering and puzzles to be solved, you know, and um, facets of the debate to acknowledge. Anything else anyone wants to ask about before we get started? Anything else to check in about about the technical features of our change in format? The, the, the This is working for people, running into any troubles? No? Cool. Not seeing anything show up in the chat. Oh, Nathan's got something.
Where's the video feed? Um, are you not seeing the video from me, Nathan? I, I think I think I'm broadcasting video right now. Okay. Log out, log back in if anything messes up. Yeah, that's usually a good strategy. Um, let's get started. And, and Nathan, if you're having trouble with it, maybe we can talk after the session too if, if you're not able to sort it out or, or just restarting it doesn't help. <clears throat> um, but I want to get started because yesterday's class just like blew by and uh, I was hoping we were going to get a little further in the discussion. I, I definitely have designs on... Oh, cool. It, it's working? Awesome. Um, I definitely have designs to get to Wittgenstein today. Absolutely. Um, but like I said at the end of class yesterday, there's still some pretty big ideas from Williams that um, I don't want to move past without addressing, at least in part. So in preparation for class today, I was thinking about how I might be able to pull up some of the threads that are left over and, and maybe um, instead of doing it in a more methodical or exhaustive way, um, kind of maybe I can we can do this a little more quickly and efficiently. It, it won't be quite as complete of you know the discussion of everything, but uh, I think I can pull some of these ideas together um, about how Williams is responding to Nagel's argument and then also how um, what the sort of upshot is for us um, in thinking about their disagreement and what we might have to say about it. I, I've got a little two cents I want to throw in there too. Um, before I do that though, <clears throat> um, I was I got a whole slew of uh, paper outline feedback uh, videos recorded last night and sent out. And uh, while I was doing that, I was like, oh yeah, YouTube has this analytics feature. I'll just take a look. And it turns out um, that uh, the I can track like how which parts of the video people are watching and there was like it starts the video and it goes for a little while it like bottoms out like people stop watching this isn't everybody you know, there were some people who watched the whole video but it seemed like a lot of people started the video and then stopped watching it and then it spikes again right at the point in the video where I talk about the code word so I don't know exactly what's going on here um, with the data, but it at least suggests something like people aren't watching the whole video and just getting the part that lets them put the code into the quiz to prove that they watched it when they didn't watch it, which is not the point. <laughs> this is not um, in the spirit of, of what is trying to happen here. And I, I don't want to have to go to some sort of system where I have to make like a substantive quiz where I ask questions about what happened in the lecture that you'd have to watch the lecture to be able to answer or something like that. I don't, I don't want to do something like that. I was This happened with one of my other sections too. It, it wasn't just the 101 section. It was also my political philosophy class. And I, I know things are busy at the end of the quarter. Um, it takes time to watch these videos to be – but I mean if, if you're in class, you'd have to be in class the whole time too. And um, – Sacrificing our class like that is not, um, I mean, it's just, it's not the spirit of education. So uh, please don't, please don't do that. Uh, I'm not going to do something more goofy in terms of like a substantive quiz or something like that for you to, to try to address this concern. I'm just going to try to make an appeal to people's sincerity here and to respect the spirit of what's happening. Um, the switch to online format was to try to make education more accessible, and if people aren't using it, I guess I, the opportunity is still there, but, um, you know, I kind of care about the substance of it actually happening as well. Um, I did get a suggestion from the chat in my political philosophy class where the problem also happened, um, that, because I know... I, I know students are tech savvy and clever about this, and there's a lot of tools at your disposal. Like, you can um, YouTube automatically generates captions now um, for for any video that's uploaded, and you can do a search in the in the transcript for code word and figure out what part of the video I'm talking about it, and then watch it. Um, so maybe I shouldn't have been advertising that technique, but I mean that's that's a thing. I, maybe people have been doing. I don't know. 
sure seems like it. Um, but uh, so a student suggested in my other class, um, have the code word be visual. So don't say it, and then it won't show up in the transcript. So I did that with the class this morning, um, and maybe I'll try it in this one too. Uh, so at, at some point, uh, it, but maybe I want to check to be fair to the people who are live, because if you're live right now and I'm, you're hearing me talk to you, you're not one of the, you're not doing something wrong because you're here for the whole thing. But is anyone in chat right now um, not watching the video and only listening? Is, is anyone not watching it? I just want to make sure if I use this visual cue for the code word, then um, if you were just listening, if you only had audio access, then you wouldn't be able to get the code word. So I can only listen when I go to chat on my phone, but when no one talks, I'm watching the feed. Okay, okay. I, I can see, yeah, if you're connected with your phone. Okay, well, let's try it. If, if there's any problem, um, you know, let me know after I'm done with the recording, and I'll, I'll tell you what the code word is and that kind of thing. Um, so we could handle it maybe that way. But uh, I thought, yeah, a student had a good idea. Might as well give it a shot. I, I don't see any harm in it, um, as long as we can prevent those uh, weird problems. Okay, let's get into it. Um, back to Williams. Let's finish this off. So, um, one of the other ways that um, Nagel talks about making his case um, is uh, saying that this making making universal claims like objective we were talking about objective truth claims is this game you can't avoid, and part of it is that uh, part of Nagel's analysis is that every time you make a claim you are doing it, you're advancing it in a universal way. So you're saying this is like an eternal truth. That's not to say that the truth might not be conditionally specific, but that it's like, because we could, I could make claims about what's true in 21st century, the 21st century world. I might not be making claims about the past. Um, but if there's something that's true about the 21st century world, then that's kind of like an eternal truth. It does, it's not a, it depends on how you're looking kind of thing. Um, so advancing claims on this universal playing field is really the only way that claims come. Uh, this is, again, trying to show that um, doing something like relativizing truth claims is just kind of unintelligible, uh, that it, it's, not, it's not supportable. You're going to have to, you can't only deal in those kinds of uh, relativized claims. We can, we can definitely say things like, depending on how you're looking, you might come up with a certain belief or find something more compelling, but then you're advancing that as a universal claim rather than something that is itself contextualized. So that's part of Nagel's argument about how we're always playing this game, um, and there, there's so you can't opt out of that. I'm going to come back to that theme here in a second. So I just want to kind of put that back on the radar and use slightly different language for it. Um, this is what he means about how we just have to go on in the same way, is that we have to just go on making objective truth claims um, there's no way to opt out of that, and that they're going to have this universal feature to them. They're going to have a universal scope in, in how they're being advanced or asserted. So we're going to come back to that in a second. Um, many people in the reading comments asked about when Williams is using this uh, two different notions of we or us, a contrastive versus an inclusive sense of we or us. And uh, this is really key idea for understanding what Williams' response to Nagel is. And I, and I kind of gave you the short of it earlier yesterday, that Williams wants to say, yep, good job, Nagel. Uh, good job defeating the, the global fatalist or skeptic or relativist or something like that. Um, you've, you've shown us something that is of insight. Uh, it's true. Uh, he sort of accepts the argument. But what he qualifies with that acceptance um, is a kind of criticism that says, well, but how much does this actually mean, Nagel? How much, uh, what are you going to do uh, when you take your victory lap on, okay, so you've been able to show that this universal fatalism is not uh, a possible option for a perspective that we, we can reasonably take. But what's the upshot of that? 
how does that change how we think about exploring disagreement or our concerns about bias, all the rest of that. And I was talking before about um, how having charity for the relativist or for the fatalist here is really appropriate. Um, like I, I described how even if you don't think the premises lead to the conclusion, the conclusion of like fatalism, those premises might be not only true, but important. There could be some insights about that. Um, Williams remarks about how um, people who adopt these fatalistic perspectives don't do it by accident. They do have reasons for that. And we need to look at those reasons fairly and charitably. And, and I think Williams would say sympathetically. Williams himself is a subjectivist, so he's somewhat um, sympathetic with the idea that truth has some stance dependency or subjectivity to it. He, being a subjectivist, he's still going to be down with Nagel talking about universal objective truth claims and that there's room for that because that's what subjectivists believe in contrast with relativists. Um, but he's, he's sort of saying, yeah, but we should probably be a little concerned about this subjectivity. So think back to um, Nagel's argument, his, his concerns about um, that our beliefs are just like this relativistic uh, bias accusation that the reason why we have confidence in the beliefs that we have confidence in is just because of some cultural bias or some kind of force of local bias, and that's it. That's why anyone believes anything. And there's nothing else to say about it other than that. Um, William says, okay, yeah, we can't, we can't go for the merely. It's not everything working this way. Not everything is bias. Um, but we can still be concerned about how much of what we think we objectively grasp is influenced by bias. In other words, Nagel's argument doesn't, if, if you accept his argument, it's not like, oh, cool, awesome, now I don't have to worry about bias ever again because it's part of this intellectual dead end or something. That, Williams is like, that. it doesn't mean that. And, and I don't think Nagel would be cool with saying that, that that makes sense either. I think he would agree with Williams' criticism here. Or just his sort of observation about what are the limits of what Nagel's argument has been able to prove, or how does it change the game. We could still be very concerned about uh, how our local circumstances affect our way of looking at the world objectively, or our attempts to understand the world objectively. Um, there's still cause for concern there that Nagel's um, arguments don't necessarily defeat. Maybe you remember the example I was using yesterday of the, the normative or ethical examples with the, the two contrasting cases, right, where we find out about diversity and it does uh, cause us or is in, it's a part of us uh, lowering some of our co confidence or conviction in our values, but in another case in which it doesn't. There's a major question here about what makes for the difference, right? Why would sometimes we lose the confidence and other times we, we don't lose the confidence? What's that going to come down to? Nagel's going to say something like, well, we've got to look at the arguments. You know, we got to weigh the considerations um, for each of those perspectives and see which one ends up holding more weight on balance after critical analysis. Someone in the chat asked me yesterday, what are you going to do about bias? How do you respond to bias? And I was saying, we'll, we'll, we'll be getting there to like something that could be an answer. And I think Williams and Nagel would kind of be on the same page here in saying that, uh, well, especially Williams would want to emphasize this, if bias is a concern, which he argues it should still be a concern, not in the global, absolute, 100% everything is bias kind of way, but in a way in which we could be doing better or worse here, we're susceptible to forces of bias, um, but how can we? But maybe we can do something different. And I think the 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 quick answer here, we could have more discussion about this if you want to, um, is the only real tool we have at our disposal is critical evaluation. So yesterday when I was describing those two cases with cultural values and a recognition of diversity, I was saying I think Nagel is going to say that. It's the recognition of multiple options that might prompt me to engage in critical reflection about my beliefs more. Where before I might just accept them without thinking critically about them. Now that I'm like, oh, there, there are other options out there. Well, let me think about those, actually. What, why might those be better than what I currently believe? Kind of a bunch of stuff from the Code of Intellectual Conduct, right? Fallibility, uh, burden of proof, 
rebuttal principle sorts of things. Charity. I'd be like, why would these other options maybe make sense? And then when I actually think about them, and I'm like, what could be said on behalf of that? I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that kind of makes more sense than whatever I was already thinking about before. But in other cases, I might look at like, yeah, how could we justify this? I don't know how. <laughs> or all the reasons don't really hold water. or They, they don't withstand scrutiny very, very well. There's other possible concerns that could add about those stories, and they don't actually add up. Um, and the original position that I had, maybe now I have a better idea of what justifies it or what makes it more rationally compelling than these other options, and so I won't abandon my confidence. Kind of like a, a story I've told before with uh, Plato and Theotetus, or I'm sorry, um, the Republic reading. Remember the, uh, the bastard story at the second half of Book 7? Um, you could be raised with a bunch of beliefs and values that you got from your parents and that's just bias, right? It's just going to be, you know, you were, this is an extreme word, but brainwashed by your upbringing into adopting a certain perspective. But then at a certain point in your life, you got to be like, okay, I've got these convictions. Should I keep them or should I change them? And just knowing that you got the beliefs from your parents or your caregivers or from your culture that you're raised in or your community doesn't tell you that you should get rid of them. It, it's just to say that's not a good enough basis for them being justified for you to retain them. So sometimes the beliefs that we had a relationship with before that was uncritical shouldn't be discarded while still saying that you should build them on a better foundation than that. Just as a personal example, um, I, and I know this is kind of a loaded issue, but um, I was raised religious, and as I started growing up, and uh, in adolescence and getting into philosophy and I got the exposure to Buddhism and all these other ideas, I was like, yeah, should I keep this or should I discard it? And um, just as an anecdotal story here, I guess I should turn my hat for this, um, I, some of it I discarded. Some of those beliefs and values, I was like, no, the, now that I'm looking at it and looking at the arguments, I'm like, no, this doesn't make sense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abandon this view or abandon this belief or abandon this value. And then there were other things that I was like, no, actually, yeah, I can, I do want to hang on to this. This does make sense. Um, but now I've got a different relationship with it. Now it's no longer like, this is how things are or something, or that's just how I was raised. But now I've got something to actually say for it as a rational defense for it. Um, so it's on stronger footing there. Um, so uh, can, it's kind of a, another personal example here. I remember being in high school uh, and I was thinking a lot about um, uh, cultural identities, gender theory, all this kind of stuff, and uh, observing the kind of social patterns of my high school as, from, as a philosopher, and uh, the kind of the game between conformity and nonconformity, how that one can just be the kind of reaction to the other kind of thing. And to be nonconformist just because of conformity and conformity having issues is also kind of doing the same sort of thing that conformity is doing. So it might be like, if you're going to choose to live one way versus another, maybe have it on some other independent basis <laughs> that could be justified for why it's good or ideal or right, rather than to just do something because everyone else is doing it is not rational. We have, that's actually an informal fallacy. I'm going to turn my hat for that. That's one of these logical fallacies that uh, we articulate in logic. Um, but we also, uh, to just do something because it's the opposite of what everyone believes is just as arbitrary. Um, just to do that for for the sake of it all by itself. Now, there, there can be really good arguments for uh, in being nonconformist in certain ways um, or for certain values. And then we're not talking about just doing it merely for, you know, then you have some actual arguments to sink your teeth into and to consider. Um, but just on its own, it, it's kind of, should be a non-issue, that kind of thing. Okay, so... Williams, um, is in trying to um, sort of look at the upshot of what is going on with Nagel's argument and what it means and what it doesn't mean and how we would detect uh, bias and figure out what or how seriously should we take it, Williams uses an example of what he calls the unconfident liberal. Someone who's like, uh, kind of like Nagel. Nagel was using his toy examples throughout his book the idea of a confidence in science and a confidence in liberal values like fundamental human rights and tolerance and stuff like that. And so Williams is like, yeah, let's imagine a person like Nagel. 
Um, but someone who's got like tons of confidence about what should happen now, like maybe in in our context, in our setting right now, it would make sense for us. It, there'd be a good thing for us to do to try to make our society reflect these values of social justice like human rights and tolerance and, and that sort of thing and that science is the best thing we've got right now to work with in terms of uh, building out a paradigm of reality and what's going on in it descriptively so the normative part and the descriptive part they might have a lot of confidence about applying those judgments here in the present circumstances that we're a part of but they might be unconfident in applying them to other times and places, other cultural contexts, other historical contexts. Um, they're like, this is right for us now, in a local sense of us, but maybe not the universal sense of us. Okay, so that's what I was offering about this distinction between a contrastive sense of us and a global sense of us. What Williams thinks Nagel has done is defeat the global fatalism. So if there's some subjectivity that attaches to thinking in general, that's not going to disturb us in terms of our pursuit of objectivity. That, that can't, that's not a, an, um, a deal breaker. But we can be very concerned about whether there are specific and contingent um, factors uh, of, say, bias or influence that attach to our lo localized sense of us, like, say, Westerners in a 21st century environment right, in America like that, or maybe Bellevue College, you could get that narrow, right? Um, or people from my family culture, that's even more narrow. Um, we could be concerned about uh, forces of bias that influence our thinking that are contingent between in a, a sense of us grounded in where we are versus where other people are at, like in, say, a historical context. Nagel is saying that when you make a claim, you got to make it universally. That when you make truth claims, they apply universally. And so Nagel says, if someone was to say, make a claim, and then say, oh, but it, it only applies here. This is only a truth for us, kind of like the relativism thing. Then, uh, and they're not willing to apply it to the rest of the world and to the rest of this like universal context of everything. Then Nagel's like, in what sense do they really sincerely believe it? And you can maybe get at the intuition Nagel's gunning for here if you think uh, of someone who says um, they value, say, human rights. They, they, like, talk the talk of human rights. But it never actually translates into any of their action. They never take that belief and apply it to the world in a meaningful way. Or let's say that you're, like, um, opposed to... Mm, you're opposed to, like, the sexist bigotry but then you never actually apply it to anybody else because you're like, well, who am I to judge? Nah, I don't know, maybe, right? If you don't apply it ever, if it never is relevant to any other situation in the world, then Nagel's like, you don't really sincerely hold that belief. It's just kind of empty words or an empty idea, right? If it's not connected, you can't assert it only contextually. You could say it's objectively true for everybody that I have something going on, or that we have something going on, you can say that. It's not like in order to make universal claims, you need to erase all of the contingent differences that exist between people. That, that's not what Nagel's saying. But he's saying that when you make a claim, you need to, you're making the claim. You're applying it to the world, and you should own up to that. And otherwise, it's not a sincere belief. Williams is like, yeah, that kind of makes some sense, Nagel. Like, it does seem like if we're going to have an authentic belief, we have to apply it to the world. But Williams puts it this way. He asks, but how much of the world do I need to apply it to? So going back to the unconfident liberal, this is someone who is, like, pretty confident about applying it to my circumstances now, to my context. I'm not so sure about applying it to these other contexts, though. And, and Williams wants to try to investigate why would the unconfident liberal have that lack of confidence and not be doing something that's running afoul of Nagel's argument against anti-realism or this kind of rational fatalism or something. Why might it be reasonable for the unconfident liberal to pause or hesitate when it comes to 
ex extending or projecting their judgments from their own context onto other contexts. Williams thinks this is reasonable. Um, sorry, I've been I've been kind of going a mile a minute here, everyone, because I'm I'm trying to like pull all these threads together, uh, and maybe maybe my attempt at efficiency is actually being less efficient in the long run. But I want to check in with you before I go any further here and see how this has been going so far. How how is everyone doing? It, um, Am I making sense? Following okay? Great examples. Cool. Awesome. I'm getting some positive uh, confirmation here. It's been intelligible. Anything that is like a weird idea that you're not quite sure about? Maybe it'd just be helpful for me to say again. Okay. Okay. Looks like it's going okay. If something is coming up for you, don't hesitate to drop it into the chat, even if it means going backwards a little bit in the conversation. That's okay. This stuff all connects up together. So, um, okay. So let's go back to William's concern here, and and I've got a um, Williams uses some funny historical cases, like he uses Louis the Fourteenth, King of France, um, and Louis the Fourteenth is chosen very intentionally by Williams here um, because. Louis the Fourteenth. I mean, he's a mixed bag. I mean, that's the that's an understatement. Um, there are big ways in which Louis the Fourteenth was. We might be tempted to say progressive, or especially progressive for his time, or something. In terms of the social, the state of affairs in society in Europe and France at this time, and what kinds of things Louis the Fourteenth was up to. Um, the patronage of the arts, secular arts. Uh, he's a humanist, um, is big. He does a lot to to f promote and fund science when science is just getting its feet under itself with the scientific revolution and, and the stuff leading up to it. Um, trying to, uh, he makes, I mean, it's still a monarchy, but he passes or he dictates, you know, dictates law that's about protection of the citizens from the monarchy. So kind of like some civil liberties, sort of, because it's not a democracy. Uh, still not that progressive, but it's still kind of moving in this direction. At the same time, he's like engaging in all these wars of conquest for his own egoistic self-conception of glory and hubris. Um, and so he's like terrible on that front. Um, and on some other things about dealing with... Um, poor uh, or disenfranchised people, he does not have a good record on these sorts of things. So on, on one level, it, to say he's a progressive, you're like, uh, no, he does not meet the standards of 21st century progressive politics. Um, at the same time, there's some things that are like sort of moving in this direction, right? So um, when what William, the use that Williams gives for this scenario is he's saying, if I'm going to be a confident, um, if I'm going to be a liberal now, and I've got these beliefs about what what does progressive politics look like, what are the standards for it, um, for me to have an authentic commitment to those beliefs and values, does it require me to go all the way through history and kind of look back on it and say, uh, like kind of looking over Louis the Fourteenth's shoulder and being like, you're fucking up, dude, that ain't right. Do I need to do that? Do I need to be able to do, should I have the confidence to project it into all times and places? Williams isn't quite sure about this. He, he's hesitant. You know, he's trying to say there could be some good reason why I would hold off on projecting what I think makes sense for right now into these other contexts. And not because I'm a relativist or an anti-realist or something. Um, I'm not referring to American liberalism, Hudson. Uh, well, I mean, this terminology is tough. If you remember back to the beginning of the lecture, I said liberalism is um, something that is a like a tradition that includes conservatives and liberals, the way we use those terms today. Um, and that's a big part of American political philosophy, the history of American political philosophy, is liberalism. The whole thing is built on liberalism. But that's what we mean. Just like I said, the, the idea that there are fundamental human rights 
that can't be transgressed, that it's wrong, it's unjust for that to happen, and a value on tolerance. That's all Nagel is thinking about here. And that's all we mean by when we're talking about the unconfident liberal. We mean the person who believes in those things. And conservatives believe it. Well, you know, not everyone, but liberals and conservatives couldn't both agree on those kinds of values. Yeah, the original definition of liberalism. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so. Oh, man, I still have 20 minutes left. Ah, so hard to do this fast. Okay, so Williams is hesitant about this projection into all times and places. Can we really get inside the context of the decision making that Louis the Fourteenth is faced with? Um, could he just go for like Bernie Sanders social socialist democracy kind of thing, democratic socialism? Maybe that doesn't fit for the time period, or or something like that. Um, I, the the best analogy or example I can give you for that maybe is a an illustration that you have intuitions that might make you sympathetic with with William's point here would be something like uh, criticizing a foreign culture that you don't really know about or understand circumstances can be different in different life circumstances like different places in the world geographically culturally people's personal circumstances can be really different and what makes sense in one context may, may not make sense in another context uh, we talk about this all the time in education with accessibility issues or cognitive differences this has come up in our class a couple times um, that what works in one place may not work in another place and that doesn't mean we're relativists <laughs> it just means there's some other details here that we need to be sensitive to in figuring out where the lines are drawn in terms of what's going on universally. We don't have to put everyone in one size fits all kind of box in order to be looking at things objectively. So if there's a culture uh, or a country, let's say a community, that I'm not really familiar with, I don't know their circumstances or I don't know what's going on with them, then I might be like, yeah, I think I know what's right for this set of circumstances, but I don't know what's right in that set of circumstances. Um, so I hesitate on making judgments about it. I, and that could be perfectly reasonable as a modesty with regard to my relative ignorance about what's going on in that situation. Just think about some uh, moral dilemmas you've had to face in your life. The first time you face them, they're unfamiliar. And you're like, I don't know yet what I think about this. And then you think about it and you work on it and try things out. And then you're like, okay, now I think I know what I think is the right thing in this circumstance. But for someone else who isn't familiar with it, hasn't worked through it all, hasn't listened first um, to understand and be sensitive to what's involved with the decision in that context, they're not in the same position. And for them to make a judgment, probably not, they're not on good footing to do so. Right? They, that their judgments are not going to be able to have um, as much rational sensitivity to be appropriate. So this is this is what Williams is thinking about. Of like, yeah, I need to apply my judgments to the world, but I might hold off on doing it universally. Now, argument on the other side of this debate. It does seem like, in some cases, we absolutely should be doing this and ought to be doing this. And here's, here's a, a good example I can provide for this. Let's take ancient Rome. Ancient Rome is a context I've got some familiarity with because I've taken history classes on it. I'm, I'm interested in history as a philosopher. Uh, you get interested in history. I also have um, I've spent a lot of time um, with this particular time period as, as like a particular place of interest. Um, so I know, I know some stuff I can get through history books, but I didn't live in ancient Rome. And there's a lot that... Um, you know the historical evidence that we got doesn't paint the full picture about you know we can we can get a lot of it but it's different to live it right it's kind of like reading about a foreign culture in a book or on the internet and then actually living there it's totally it could be there could be all sorts of things that that book isn't able to tell you about okay um, that are, are maybe relevant to what's going on so I don't know so much about I, I wouldn't claim that I know what it was like to live like as a Roman in Roman times but I do know that they had slavery. And given my liberal values, I think slavery is unjust and immoral, and there is no excuse for it. There is no justification for slavery that is theoretically possible. Now, you might disagree with me about that. Um, I feel like that's not too hard to justify, but we, we could have a debate if you wanted to. Like, what about this really extreme scenario in which slavery would be okay or something? But that's my position. Let's maybe just run with it for the sake of argument here for this example. Slavery's got deep, deep problems when it comes to justice. So even though I don't know everything about the circumstances of the Romans and what's going on with them, 
it seems like it's it is appropriate i i am in a position because of the arguments that i've got available for understanding the justice of slavery to look back at ancient rome and being like you done fucked up like this ain't right we don't care what the circumstances are um they're not going to be able to justify this sort of thing that it is appropriate for us to go back in history and not just say oh well it was a different time like like I, i've mentioned before with aristotle aristotle's a massive misogynist and i'm not going to give him any free passes because well he's just a product of his time or something he can know better his teacher plato knows better he gives him the arguments and he's not responsive to them and we can say yeah it might be harder to uh, advocate for something like that when your culture is not supporting it. Um, maybe our times are a little bit, we've got some privilege here for having liberal values, maybe in the state of Washington, because more people agree with us. Although Washington's actually fairly conservative in a sneaky sort of way. Anyway, I mean, about at least on sexism, um, this is a bad thing. So maybe there's more support for it because of our time and place. It's easier to do it. But does that mean it, it would be okay if it was harder or inconvenient? seems like a lot of stuff about justice doesn't work this way. That justice is about what's right, and it's not just a matter of is it convenient for you to care about justice. It's got to be, no, this really matters. And that's the kind of thing that Nagel's interested in defending. So I want to give you my kind of little two cents on this. Um before we leave this behind. So I think Williams and Nagel, so I'm going to turn my hat completely like this. I think Williams and Nagel both have good points here, and they see themselves as intention, but I actually think there's a way to, to separate out and, and make a syn synthetic unity out of what both of them are saying. So here's my proposal. Nagel's right on the matter of logic, that when we assert a claim, we do assert it as a universal truth. So even if I say like, me today, I'm wearing a Rainier's hat, a Tacoma Rainier's hat. That's true for me today. I'm asserting that as like a fact that is true for all times and places, like apart from time. Even in the past, you know, they didn't know about the future. But if we're thinking about it eternally outside of time, it was a fact that on March 5th, 2020, while Tim was giving his lecture to his intro students online, he was wearing a Tacoma Rainier's hat. So even the, even the claim, no matter how specific it is, is asserted as a universal sort of truth. And there's nothing else for, we, for us to do. I, I think Nagel is sort of right about that. So in terms of the scope of the application of the claim, when it's applying to the world, it's applying on this universal playing field of what is objectively true. But acknowledging that, that this is the logical form of judgment, doesn't mean that the content or the substance of our judgments could be very modestly designed. Like, if I want to make claims about justice, I could say, well, in this particular situation, I think this is the just result, and not necessarily talking about all the other situations. Uh, maybe, and some of you have been working on ethical papers, um, and we've narrowed down the focus of, to have your paper be less ambitious and get out of control in exactly this way, by limiting the scope of the ambition of what is your thesis that you want to defend. So we might be able to have the Williams kind of modesty about what we're in a position to speak on, like that we have good enough arguments to be able to make claims about, um, that could be more limited, even though we are still applying them on a universal playing field. So that's my quick way of trying to uh, sort of separate out what are the contributions that both Williams and Nagel make to this ongoing conversation. Um, okay, uh, again, time has somewhat slipped through my fingers, and um, so we have 10 minutes left to discuss uh, Wittgenstein. And um, I, I'm trying to, I'm really torn right now of like, should we just go for it with Wittgenstein and get started, or do people have questions about the Nagel-Williams thing? Um, and maybe we should just spend our remaining time talking about that. Um, I'm going to let the people who are here live uh, tell me what, what you think. What's your preference? So I'll just kind of give you 20 seconds here to type in a response, and, and I'll run with it for the sake of expediency. Oh, and um, let me take care of the thing that we talked about earlier. So this came up from my political philosophy class this morning, so that's why I, uh, why we did it. Here, I bet you can see this. Hehehehe. <laughs>
everyone. Eyes, eyes on the screen. There you go. And those of you watching this on YouTube, I know it's mirrored, but um, I think you can figure out what's going on here. <laughs> yeah, maybe we do. I, I wanted to be on good behavior here with the lecture to leave plenty of time where we could do a substantive work with Wittgenstein. But yeah, I think people in chat, I think you're right. Um, so uh, we got a few minutes here. Let's let's see what people are thinking about um, this Williams Nagel discussion. Questions, reactions, comments. Well, let's use our time productively. No one's saying anything. Is it all just making perfect sense? I, am, I, am I that good of a lecturer? <laughs> I don't have that amount of uh, hubris. So I'm sure there's some stuff that I could explain a little bit more or better than how I did explain them. Is the whole talk of, of Nagel just discussing how bias can taint our views? Um, I think it's about acknowledging the the limits about how much we are able to understand objectively, or even so. Williams' kind of on balance response here is objective truth seeking is the only game in town. Nagel's right about that, and to try to opt out of that, or to say yeah, this is something humans can't do, or something productively. That that's just not that's a non-starter. It's not an option. It's a dead end to to think that way. But in our efforts at seeking the truth, we absolutely must have a recognition of the limits of our understanding, um, what we understand, what we don't, and the way in which our basis for belief can be influenced by factors that don't have to do with evidence or reasoning. And the antidote is to try to engage with that sincerely. And that means modestly. So thinking about where are my blind spots? What things am I not considering? This is why charity is so important. Try to find who your opponents are. What do they have to say for themselves when you might have a hard time coming up with that on your own because you don't agree with them? You know, you're not sympathetic with those views. Um, that, I think, is what Williams is encouraging, is to, to recognize how the circumstances and the contingencies of what we're working with as we pursue the truth, what does it mean to go on in the same way, um, is itself something that is not absolute, that we don't have some uh, absolute relationship with or connection with. Um, Nathan asks, so bias comes from what we already know and can be resolved by obtaining knowledge, right? So there's different forms of bias. Um, the definition I've been using for this lecture that I offered before was bias refers to those forces which influence our belief that don't have to do with evidence and argument. So it's not as though, I don't think we, it's a useful to use the word in the way that because I have access to this evidence, now I'm biased to the belief that the evidence justifies or proves or something like that. I mean, rational, the whole point is that a rational consideration is on a different level than just a causal explanation for why I have a belief. And it's more that causal stuff that we're talking about with bias. Um, these things that um, distort our ability to do this rational truth-seeking, objective truth-seeking. Um, so the things that we already know, um, sort of, they have a legitimate role to play in the truth-seeking process. But maybe recognizing the things that are not being said, that's where the bias comes from. Not so much of what we already have contact with, but it's about what we don't have contact with or the way in which there are other ways of looking at or contextualizing or theorizing about the stuff that we think that we know. And just, you know, on its own, like, maybe we're wrong. <laughs> you know, just the bare fallibility of our, of the, our, the beliefs that we already have conviction about. Is that answering your question, Nathan?
Yep, okay, cool. Bernadette says, this is so relevant today. Um, yep, I think so. <laughs> I probably wouldn't put this reading in here. Uh, well, I, I may have would. I mean, this is interesting um, just as far as the, the big picture discussion that philosophers have been having about the truth and knowledge and reasoning from the very beginning, um, uh, from the dawn of, of philosophy in all the different places in the world in which it was uh, it sort of started to arise. This has always been uh, a conversation. Um, this realism, relativism, subjectivism debate um, is cross-cultural. This is not just a curiosity of Western philosophy. It's not just a bias of Western philosophy, you could say. Um, in my journeys, the, the, the thing I can speak to is what I've had contact with and spent time listening to. And uh, Buddhism is, is probably one of the biggest ones that I've done this with. Buddhism is really geographically temporally, culturally removed from what's going on in the Western philosophical tradition, intellectual tradition, all the same questions show up there. You got the same debates about realism, relativism, and subjectivism going on in that context too. Um, so it does have some some universal interest, but I, I definitely agree, Bernadette, that um, it, it seems like this is a big picture philosophy topic that would be very practical for people to be spending time thinking about. Accusations of bias get thrown around a lot these days. And uh, for my money, hat turned here, the answer is not that they're always inappropriate. And the answer is not that they're always inappropriate either. That there is a, a legitimate role for concern about bias to have provided it doesn't go to the kind of extremities that Nagel is uh, criticizing. This is this is one of the readings, I don't always give you readings in class that I agree with, but um, and I don't completely agree with Williams and Nagel in this, um, but a lot of what they had to say I think I'm, I'm very sympathetic to. Being charitable on issues is key. I mean, it's a big tool in our toolkit for dealing with bias, is having charity. To, to get things on the map that we aren't otherwise tracking and factoring in. Think about the when we've talked about sort of truth seeking before in the class. Um, as we study more or think more, reflect more, debate more, investigate more, more ideas get thrown onto the table of the debate. And whenever, in any position that we're at, we're always trying to think what's the most rationally defensible view. And we kind of just have to work with what, we, what we've got to work with in figuring out how the chips are falling. But you can imagine how more cards dropping on the table changes that game. It was very rational to endorse Newton's theory of physics back when he created it. Nowadays it isn't. Because in the words of the dude from Big Lebowski, some new shit has come to light. Right? And that changes the rational calculus of, of what is the most reasonable position. So if you're thinking just for yourself personally, you've got the life experience you have, you have the educational exposure that you have, um, and there's a whole lot more out there that you don't have. And if you wanted to do something about the sort of standing concern about bias, um, it'd be a matter of trying to hear more, trying to listen to more, and to weigh it as fairly as possible. So charity really helps on that front. It's not the only type of threat of bias that we can be facing, but it's a, that, that's a big one right there, the kind of blind spots of what we're not considering. I feel like I'm a better person now listening to this. Uh. <laughs> um I'm I'd be curious to hear more of what you are thinking about what that caused you to write that, Bernadette. Um, but I I can definitely say this. Um, this stuff about rationality and like I teach logic classes. Um, sometimes they may not feel like they're about ethics or something, but that's really what I think. I, that's why I tell my critical reasoning students in the first week, like when I'm doing the syllabus and everything, I'm like. You might just think this is a logic class, and a lot of times logic classes get taught like that. It's like, here's how arguments work. Those are the rules. Don't be irrational. <laughs> but I, the way I frame it for my students is to live a life where you're trying to hold your beliefs and values accountable 
to this set of rational standards is an ethical paradigm. It's one lifestyle, and there are other lifestyles out there. You've got lots of options for how you can decide what you're going to believe, what you're going to value, and how you're going to act. You, you don't have to use critical reasoning in the sense of just what your options are. But I think it's a good one. <laughs> it's definitely maybe something that we ought to do. Um, but it, it's worth acknowledging it as, as having those sorts of ethical connections to it to think, is this the way we ought to live? Is this kind of lifestyle the way we ought to go about our business in making these decisions about what to believe, right, and how to act? There are other options. They may not be better, though. And there can be grounds for concerns about doing it in this kind of Western philosophy, reason-based kind of way, too. There's, And that's something philosophers discuss extensively. Um, is it really the best? And what are the possible concerns? What are the possible ways in which just assuming that those standards of rationality are correct is itself its own form of dogmatic bias or something like we, I mean, we, we really take the concern about bias seriously in philosophy and try to hold ourselves accountable to this really high standard of rigor. And it has ethical implications. Okay, you got to go. Yeah, I know everyone has to go. I, I went a little long here. It's past 120. So uh, skedaddle if you have to. If you want to talk more, um, I'll be here for a few minutes here. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll stop the recording here and start getting it uploaded. Uh, but I'll be around here to chat if you want to. You're welcome. See you tomorrow. Sorry we didn't get to Wittgenstein. I'm... Uh, I should have guessed, <laughs> but I hope it's been worth the extra time working on this one.